Hey church, it's so great to see you. I pray that you are doing well. We're so happy that you're here. If this is your first time with us here at Calvary, go ahead and text the number at the bottom of the screen. We'd love to get connected with you and do life with you and walk beside you. We are gonna be taking communion today, so if you don't have communion elements, go ahead and pause this video and go ahead and grab yourself some bread, some juice, something to eat, something to drink, and we'll partake together later on in the service. But as for now, let's go ahead and move forward in a time of worship and prepare our hearts for the Lord. Lord, we just thank you so much for your love and your grace and your beautiful creation, Lord. We just ask God that as we enter into this time of worship, Lord, that, that you would just be present in our every thought, in our every word, in our every motive in our heart, God. We ask, Lord, that you would cast aside all of our burdens, all of our hurts and pains and stress, God, that we have entered into this moment with. And we ask, Lord, that you would just become present in the one thing on our minds and in our hearts, God. We give you this time of worship. We offer up an altar of praise to you today. In your name we pray, amen. Let's worship. Let praise, let praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. And let it rise, let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. And let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall and watch the giants fall. And fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise you Oh, we praise you Oh, oh, oh. let faith Let faith be the song that overcomes the rage and sea let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me And let it rise, let praise arise We'll see you break down every wall And watch the giants fall And fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side and cry, God, we praise you. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what heaven looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you, we'll see you break down every wall, and watch the giants fall, and fear cannot survive when we praise you, the God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high, with all creation cry, God we praise you.
There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Oh, I've tasted. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord let's sing this together Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit you are well place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. Oh, I've tasted. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit. become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness your presence Lord. holy spirit and holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Father, we just thank you so much for your presence, for your glory, God, coming down and 
just coming into our lives and our hearts, God. We just recognize that and we recognize your sacrifice and your love for us, Lord. We just give you thanks. And Father, we just ask, Lord, as we present our tithes and our offerings to you today, Lord, we do it with a full heart, Lord, of love as an act of worship unto you, Father. We just ask, Lord, for, for just more of you, everything we do, Lord, as an act of worship. In your name we pray, amen. We're gonna go ahead and take communion. So if you have your communion elements, let's go ahead and partake together. Let's go ahead and take our drink and our cup and just remember that sacrifice that the Lord um, has made on our behalf that night and he's sitting around with his disciples and he says as he pours the wine into the glass that this is his blood that is going to be shed for them for us and for all of humanity that as we partake in this drink do it as a remembrance of him and his blood that was shed for us every beat every lashing even as they took the spear and jabbed it into his side, every drip that just flowed from him in remembrance of his love and his grace for us. So go ahead and take your drink and partake. And that same night he took the bread and he said, this is my body which has been broken for you. He took the bread and he broke it as a resemblance of his body, for us to remember the brokenness that he shed for us. Every broken bone, including his broken heart that he shed and, and gave for us on his behalf. And as we just take this bread, just remember the sacrifice um, that he bore upon his body for us. Let's go ahead and partake together. Father, we recognize the sacrifice that you have given so that we could be here today, right now, in this very moment. Wherever we're at, God, wherever we're sitting, watching this, remembering your true sacrifice and the love that you displayed as you put your arms out on that cross, God, and said that I love them this much and you gave it all. We just recognize that, God. But with that, we also rejoice because we know that three days after you rose again and you fulfilled that promise, God. And, and here you are today, not looking at us with our sin, God, but knowing that you fulfilled that sin. So we rejoice in that today and we give you praise and thanks. We love you so much, Lord, and we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you have shed for us. In your name, we give thanks and praise. Let's continue to worship. I live for you alone and 
every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart, and Lord, I give you my heart. Well, good morning and thank you so much Calvary Monterey for having me with you today. My name is Pastor Pilgrim Benham. I'm the pastor of Shoreline Church in Bradenton, Florida. And it's really an honor for me to be with you here this weekend. And I have to say your pastor, Pastor Nate, is a good friend and he has the best preaching voice on the planet. So I have my work cut out for me today as I share God's word with you together. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Colossians chapter one. Again, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. And God is so good to us to give us his word. In the book of Colossians, I just want to read the first 15 or 20 verses or so, and then we're going to spend some time in verses 12, 13, and 14. So if you have your Bibles, Colossians 1, turn there or swipe there. We're going to be looking at Colossians 1, 1 through 20. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you've heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, And then here's the three verses we're going to spend our time together uh, dissecting and studying this morning. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What a powerful passage of Scripture. Now, as we begin our study this morning, did you know that after the Bible, which we almost would separate the Bible in its own category, but after the Bible and after William Shakespeare, the third best-selling writer or novelist, you can take a guess and win at trivia, but the third best-selling writer or book or author uh, is Agatha Christie. And you've probably heard of Agatha Christie. She was a mystery writer. She wrote at least 66 different detective novels, and many of them featured this French detective named Poirot. You may have heard of him from Murder on the Orient Express, or actually there's a movie out currently at theaters called Death on the Nile, and that was written by Agatha Christie. Very fascinating murder mystery writer. But what you may not have known is that in 1926, Agatha Christie was the subject of her own mystery. She actually went missing for over 10 days. And on the 11th day, she reappeared over 200 miles from where her car had been located. When her husband identified her, she had no memory whatsoever of not only what had happened to her, how she had gotten there, but also who her husband was and who she was. I find it ironic that a woman known for writing these incredible stories where the reader is engrossed in solving mysteries was now the subject of her own riddle. And she became as lost in her own life as we do as readers of her novels. Now, it may not be physical amnesia, but the church in Colossae, to whom Paul addresses the the letter that we just began reading, this church may have been tempted by a sort of spiritual memory loss. Though they were in Christ, their faith was being threatened because they had seemingly forgotten who they were and whose they were. Of all the churches that Paul wrote letters to, and he wrote quite a few, the city of Colossae may have been the most insignificant. Back in the year 60 AD, they were decimated by a massive earthquake. And it used to be a bustling and important town, but after the earthquake, it never truly recovered. And yet there were some spiritual rumblings that were taking place far more significant than uh, what you guys have to deal with in California, which we don't have in Florida whatsoever. We don't have earthquakes. Uh, we have humidity. And so even though Colossae was the most in- insignificant of all the cities that Paul wrote to, the message of the book of Colossians is perhaps the most significant message that we can ever hear because this letter declares to us in the text that we've just read the supremacy of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, and the power of what our identity is as followers of Christ. Now, as a church, you've been studying the book of Nehemiah, and I'm a visitor, I'm a guest uh, speaker here, Uh, but what I've been uh, updated on is that you've been studying the book of Nehemiah and how God brings renewal in the life of his people. Most recently, in the last week or so, understanding that God reminds his people of their story. And and you looked at Nehemiah chapter 9 at how God was reminding the Israelites of their story, reminding them of who they were and whose they were. And what I want to do in our session here today in our our study is to lean a little deeper into that this morning. And and not necessarily at the people of Israel, but uh, those of us who are in Christ. And I want us to see what Paul prayed for the Colossian church to know. You could say to be reminded of, to be reminded of who they were in the story. So we're going to zoom in and we're going to see three things from verses 12 13 and 14. We're going to see that we, first of all, are qualified to receive an inheritance. We're going to see that from verse 12. But secondly, we're going to see that we are delivered from one kingdom to another, verse 13. 
And finally, we'll see that we are redeemed for God's glory in verse 14. But first, to set that up, notice what Paul thanks God for concerning the Colossian believers. In verse 3, he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of, here it is, your faith in Christ Jesus, and secondly, the love you have for all the saints, and thirdly, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So Paul thanks God for the three things that happen to remain for every Christian. Did you catch it? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is, you can say it from your house, if you know this, it's love. Paul always thanked God for the Colossians when he prayed for them. He says in verse 6 that God's gospel has come to them and it was bearing fruit everywhere it was going around the world of the Roman Empire. And from the very first day that they heard it and understood God's grace, and from the person they learned it from, Epaphras, the man who most likely planted the church there, Paul was expressing his gratitude to God for the work of the gospel and the fruit of the gospel in their fellowship. Well, then in verse 9, we get Paul's prayer. He says in verse 9, And so from the day we heard, the day we heard of the fruit that the gospel is reaping in your life, we've not ceased to pray for you. You'd imagine that Paul would stop praying once he heard that things were going well. But when he heard things are going well, he said, okay, we really need to pray. And so he says in verse 9, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul's consistent prayer for them was to be filled up with the knowledge of, of God's will in all wisdom and in all understanding. Why? So that they could live a life that pleases God. If you notice the next part in verse 10, he says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul's argument in his prayer was, Lord, I want them to have more knowledge of who you are because that will directly influence how they live. And as they grow in Christ, Lord, I'm praying that that will give them more knowledge of you so that they continue to grow. And so what Paul's praying for is that we would be equipped with the tools to truly live the Christian life. I think that all of Paul's letters give us a template for Paul's prayers and for the Christian life. So Paul writes his letters flowing from the theological into the practical. And that's where the lifeline flows. The fruit on the tree is only possible because of the roots underground, which are nourishing the fruit. It isn't the other way around. We're not just told to obey. Paul doesn't begin his letter saying, hey guys, you need to obey God. And then just check your theology at the door and be obedient. But neither is this only about being able to win at Bible trivia. I told the men this weekend at the Resilient Men's Conference, we had an amazing time together, But I told them this weekend that our spiritual growth in the knowledge of God is not just mentally, it's it's not just intellectually, as though the church gathering was just merely a class that we attend and hope that by the end of the class, we're going to be able to regurgitate the material and get an A. That's not the idea at all. To grow in the knowledge of God immediately bears fruit in obedience to God. And as we obey God, then we should seek to add to our faith more knowledge. That's what 2 Peter 1 says tells us. So Paul prays that they as a church would be, would be strengthened, equipped with all power, but it would be according to his glorious might. One person pointed out that the Colossian Christians, quote, were coming to Christ from a secret wisdom tradition steeped in demonology and spirit worship. Their constant temptation was to revert back to those practices and to treat Christ as just another spirit among many. So that's why Paul goes on to speak about what we just read, the the power and the preeminence of Christ beginning in verse 15. Just look in your Bibles again with me how Christ is set apart and is actually set above. He's in a class above the rest. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. That word image is the word icon. He is the icon. He is the, the representation of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. The things you can see, the things you can't see. 
And then he mentions some of these spiritual powers. He says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And by the way, those are the things that the Colossian false teachers all placed a high priority in. He says, though, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. And then he says in verse 17, he's before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head, not only of creation, but of the church. In fact, when you get to the word preeminent in verse 18, that in everything he might be preeminent. That word in the Greek literally means the one in first place. Uh, The Greek dictionary defines that word preeminent as having the paramount rank, as having dignity or importance, to be outstanding. Not just in the sense of, wow, that was an outstanding sunset, but in, in the sense that it stands out. And the Greek dictionary defines preeminent as marked by eminence. Or you could say excellence, greatness, superiority, a position of distinction above all things. There is no thing and no one who compares with Jesus. He is above all things. And thus in chapter 3, we are told when we get to the practical aspect of Colossians, we're told now to seek the things that are above, where Christ is. Christ is above all things. We are to now live seeking the things above all these things. Now, in verses 12 through 14, we see Paul thanking the Father, noting three big things that he describes the Father doing. And I'd love for you to take note of these. These are the three things I don't want you to miss today. So first, Paul thanks God the Father for making the believers qualified. Look at verse 12. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. If you have your Bibles and you're able to circle that word or highlight the word qualified, that word means to make fit or to render competent. The idea is that prior to God, the Father making you qualified, you weren't competent. You weren't fit. You weren't qualified to share in an inheritance, but now you are. In the last few years, the federal government has been giving out stimulus money, not just to anyone, not just to everyone. There were qualifications that you had to meet to receive that money. For example, you had to make under a certain amount of income each year, and you had to file taxes for the previous year. You had to have your direct deposit information ready to go with the bank. And the IRS system had to have all those things checked off in order for you to receive a stimulus. But notice with me who qualifies you. It does not say in verse 12, giving thanks to our good works, which have qualified us uh, to have the inheritance. No, it's the Father who qualifies us. You and I, we are not born as natural heirs that anticipate an inheritance. No, we were outsiders. The men at the men's conference, we talked about this in one of the sessions, how we were excluded. We are outside of the covenant. And yet the Father has welcomed us in. He has adopted us into His glorious family. And now because of that qualification, you and I, though we are still sinners, now we are considered saints, collectively, plural. We are now qualified to share in an inheritance that we previously would not be qualified to attain. Isn't it wonderful, beloved, to know that you can do nothing to be qualified for this inheritance? I mean, that is glorious good news. It doesn't matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter uh, what side of town you grew up on. It doesn't matter what model car you happen to drive or what brand names are stitched onto your clothing, what your net worth is or how spiritual or law-abiding and good you claim to be. It doesn't matter if you've never gotten a ticket and you, you happen to floss. It doesn't matter. The only way to be qualified for this inheritance is for the Father to give the approval. Romans 8, 17 declares that we are joint heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. And Christ is the Son, and the Son has received the inheritance. And the Bible says you and I are co-heirs with the true Son. We've been adopted into His family. Now here, Paul says we've been qualified to share in that inheritance of the saints in light. So this is not something we work for, it's something we work from. Because it has been freely bestowed on us based on not our works, but on our last name. Based on our family heritage. And we are in 
Christ. We've been named in the Beloved. Now, it would be great enough to know that we were going to inherit some great wealth. If you found out that you had a long-lost relative and you were due to inherit a huge amount of money, that would have been great news. But it is greater news still because true riches are found in the glory of His inheritance. We need not fear that that inheritance is going to be taken from us. In fact, 1 Peter 1, 3-4 through 4, tells us that this inheritance is incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Many of us don't realize the privilege that we have through Christ and in Christ as a joint heir. Now, let's look at the second thing that Paul thanks the Father for. Not only are we qualified, verse 12, but in verse 13, secondly, we have been delivered. He says in verse 13, He has delivered us, this is past tense, from the domain of darkness and transferred us, past tense, to the kingdom of his beloved son. That word delivered or transferred uh, can also be, in some translations, the word rescue. Our salvation was a rescue operation. Another way to translate that phrase domain of darkness uh, is very fascinating. It's actually translated a power of darkness. This was the phrase that Jesus used in the garden. He says, now is the hour, the power of darkness will be judged. One commentator says that these words, power of darkness, refer to a sinister force marshaled against the believer for decisive combat in the spiritual realm. So what happened before we were delivered? Before we were delivered from the domain of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, if you would, before that happened, we were in our natural state. Ephesians 2 says we were children of wrath. We were in darkness. We were spiritually dead. These are all different ways of describing the same condition, spiritually blind. We fumbled around in the darkness in our own spiritual ignorance, and we were held under and among the power of the domain of darkness, the power in the domain of Satan. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says this, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us. Do you see the two aspects of that? So the means of our deliverance, of our rescue mission, was the propitiation of Christ at Calvary, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Jesus came and he paid the price at Calvary, and in so doing, he rescued us And he transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. William Barclay explains that that word transfer is also the word convey. And it's a very fascinating word. It's a word that's used in the ancient world when one empire would invade and take over another empire. And what happened is when they conquered, they would transfer all the land, all the people, all the plunder completely over to the conqueror's land. We see this starting to happen in places like Ukraine today. If you're following the news, Russia, of course, is invading and seeking to occupy and declare that the Ukrainians' land is now Russian land. And yet, in the ancient world, if Persia, for example, came and conquered your land, you were now transferred to the Persian Empire. You are now subjects of that empire as well as everything that you owned. So think of, those are the negative examples, but think of the spiritual significance of this. The fact that the scripture describes two kingdoms. There really are only two cosmic kingdoms. You may have heard of the United Kingdom. You may have heard of the Roman Empire and all these different kingdoms and empires that have existed. But scripturally, there's two. And so we have the true kingdom. We call it the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And this is the rule, the reign, and the realm of Christ who is king. He is the king of kings, and he created all things, as we've just read, completely distinct from creation, though he entered it. He has dominion and authority over all of creation. And this king, Jesus, was eternal, but he entered his creation. He entered time, space, place, and race, and was incarnate as a child, as a baby. When Jesus uh, began to minister, he taught about his kingdom. Uh, and the pervasive influence that his kingdom would have. He demonstrated his kingdom by overcoming 
not only nature, natural forces, but supernatural, spiritual forces of darkness. He reversed the demonic influences over creation. He revealed his kingdom to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. And then he suffered and he died to be crowned, not one day in the future, but he was coronated with the crown of thorns. And as he is the true king, he vanquished his foes through his own crucifixion. But we know he rose again triumphantly on the third day. And when he did so, he conquered the final enemy, death, which has plagued creation since the fall. So you become a citizen of this kingdom by repenting of your sin and trusting Christ for your salvation. The Bible uses the phrase born again. You're born again from above and you're now right with the king. You've now made uh, uh, or you now have all the blessings and the benefits of his kingdom and you're a part of his people. You're now a citizen of his kingdom. However, there is a second kingdom. There is a corrupted, diabolical kingdom which stands in absolute opposition to the kingdom of Christ. Now, over time, it's gone by different names. It's gone by the name of Rome or Babylon, or you could call it the kingdom of Satan or self. But the agenda in the, oppos- uh, the opposing kingdom is always the same agenda. The agenda is to resist, to defy, and to war against the kingdom of heaven. Whether it was Satan, or it was Adam, or it was you, the, the mantra is still the same. Pursue selfish desires, have vanity and hubris, and exalt yourself to the throne. Engage the flesh and the world system to achieve your own greatness and glory. The template's still the same. When the battle was fought, so to speak, in the Garden of Eden, it was seemingly won by this wicked kingdom, but it eventually suffered a devastating defeat. And we read about this in Genesis 3.15, that one day the seed would crush the head of the serpent. Now, because of the fall in the garden, you and I are by nature a citizen, not of heaven, but a citizen of of this diabolical false kingdom. So that means you and I are at enmity with the king. We we see people right now in Ukraine saying, I didn't fight this war, I'm I'm just a private citizen. And yet war has been declared. Uh, And so you and I, as hard as it is to hear this, scripturally are hostile enemies of the Father, the omnipotent creator. And what happened at Calvary is that Jesus publicly disarmed all the satanic demonic powers and stripped them of their strength. He humiliated them and he conquered them forever on the cross where Satan believed this was the final victory. We learn of this in Colossians 2.15. It says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So by nature, in our natural state, we are enemies of God, but because of Christ's death and resurrection, We've now been rescued and we've been transferred into his kingdom. And so our lives are now not opposite or opposed or at enmity with him, but now we've been adopted and we've been delivered. Like Mephibosheth in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Samuel, you and I were enemies and we were crippled. And yet the king has welcomed us to sit at his table. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. He says, beloved, we are still tempted by Satan but we are not under his power. We have to fight with him, but we are not his slaves. He is not our king. He has no rights over us. We do not obey him. We will not listen to his temptation. You see, what a, what a picture Paul uses. We have been, you have been delivered from the domain of darkness. You have been transferred, conveyed into the kingdom of light. Everything you are, everything you have is now under the lordship of King Jesus. If you've repented of your sin and you've trusted Christ, the Father has delivered you through the work of Christ. So not only are we qualified to receive an inheritance, not only are we delivered from darkness into a new kingdom, but thirdly, it gets even better. Number three, we are redeemed. Look at verse 14. It says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins redemption and forgiveness. You want to circle those words? These are financial words. Now, I, don't, I know we don't like talking about finances right now because uh, gas prices are going crazy and inflation, and so we don't want to talk about money. I get it. A little bit of stress there. 
but these are financial terms. And the word redemption means to buy something that you previously owned back, to buy it back. Whereas forgiveness means to settle a debt, to pay something so the debt is paid for. If you had a slave and you wanted to secure that slave's freedom, you could redeem them. That means pay the price of their redemption, the price of ransom, if you would. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, the son of man, that's him, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's that word picture there, to give his life as, as someone who would buy back a slave. Now, you and I, we, we don't have the, uh, the spiritual currency to buy ourselves out of slavery. No, a price had to be paid by someone willing and able to free us from the slavery we were in, in our sin. Romans 3.24 says this redemption is in Christ Jesus. So redemption points to the sufficiency of Christ because it is through faith in his blood, not in our works. It's through faith in his blood that our sins are, are forgiven. We are dependent upon someone else paying the price of redemption for us. And thankfully, Christ has done that at the cross. So we are redeemed. But the major aspect of this redemption is, is that second part where he says the forgiveness of sins, the fact that our sins have been forgiven. If you and I weren't redeemed, we would still be dead in our sin. We would still be guilty before a holy God. You and I would not be able to satisfy the wrath of a just God through any means that's out there. And there's a lot of ideas out there about how to live the perfect life, how to live the life uh, that is the example. There's a lot of fancy diets that are out there. There's a lot of humane society support. There's a lot of care for the environment. There's a lot of good works that we can do. And yet, we could do every good work conceived under heaven and still face an eternity in hell. Jesus' rescue mission wasn't just to rescue us from Satan. It was to rescue us from our sin. No spiritual power under heaven can qualify us to be God's children. No spiritual power under heaven can keep us in its hostile grip if Christ has set us free. No spiritual power can threaten to undo our salvation if Christ has paid the price and forgiven us. We have been qualified, delivered, and redeemed. What great truths these are. In fact, the theologian N.T. Wright calls these the new exodus. You last week saw in the book of Nehemiah how Israel remembered their deliverance from Egypt. They remembered their wilderness wanderings and they remembered finally the covenant that God had made with them. Here in Colossians 1, 12 through 14, we discover a similar story. We discover that in Christ, we are also a people. We're a people who have been delivered and brought into a new and spacious place because of the God of promise. You see, the gospel is not something that we graduate from and move on to more important other things. No, we never move on from the gospel. We move deeper into the gospel. We grow and mature in our faith, in the knowledge of God, and that enables us, allows us uh, to be fruitful. And then as we're fruitful, we add to our faith more knowledge. But we go deeper into the things of the gospel. Now, in light of these three glorious identity markers, I have three ways that we can respond. There's a lot of ways you can respond by the, the, by the Spirit's prompting, but these are three that I wanted to share with you. So these are three responses in light of what we just read. First of all, because you are qualified, I just want to encourage you to rest. Just rest. Beloved, you need to rest in the truth this morning that the work has been finished. Jesus didn't cry out from the cross. It has started. <laughs> Meaning that, well, I'm going to begin the work of salvation, but now I'm going to leave it to you to add to that work of, of atonement. No, the work has been completed. The last words Jesus spoke on the cross are written over every believer. It's written over every list of sins that you can keep producing against yourself or others. These words are written over every charge that Satan would bring against you. Christ victoriously proclaims it is finished. To tell us die, paid in full. Charles Spurgeon said, there's nothing more for God to do. It's finished. 
There's nothing for you to do. It's finished. Christ need not bleed anymore. It's finished. You need not weep. It's finished. God the Holy Spirit need not delay because you're unworthy, nor need you delay because you're helpless. It is finished. Every stumbling block is rolled out of the road. Every gate has been opened. The bars of brass are broken. The gates of iron are burst asunder. It is finished. Come and welcome. Come and welcome. So beloved, because you're qualified, take a deep breath this morning and rest in the finished work of Christ. Secondly, because you are delivered, I want to encourage you to obey. You see, Satan has no power over the rescued believer's life. You no longer have to sin when you're tempted. The war is over. I was fascinated reading about a World War II Japanese soldier who actually ended up isolated from the war on a very small uh, private island in the Philippines. He ended up getting cut off from all communications. And yet the last order he had received was to secure and protect the island. What's strange though is that because he didn't have communications, years went by, years beyond when the Allies had won. Germany, Italy, and Japan had surrendered. And this soldier didn't know about the victory. And thus he refused to believe the war was over for 30 years until the mid-1970s. This soldier kept defending his island and he didn't realize surrender had already happened. And some of us as Christians, we live our lives that way. We're still stuck in the old battles. We still live as though we're prisoners of war, still living in our flesh, living as though we're still dead in our sins, rather than walking in the freedom and the obedience that we've been given because of Christ. So believer, because you've been delivered from darkness, walk in obedience and walk in the light. God has rescued you because of his son into the kingdom of light. So as 1 John says, walk in the light as he is in the light. Finally, because you are forgiven, give thanks. Paul could look at the work of God in our salvation and simply say, thank you, God. And our response should be the same. Because of all that we've been forgiven and all that we've been given, may our hearts and our mouths be filled with gratitude towards God. May we not suffer from spiritual amnesia, forgetting who we are, but remembering our part in the story. As we close today, speaking of stories, we've all heard of the folk story of the damsel in distress. She's typically a woman of great wealth or great worth, a woman of nobility. And maybe you've heard this from folklore, but she is, is a woman of great worth, great status, and she was kidnapped by a dragon and locked in a fortress, usually a castle. But then there's a knight, and the knight is hired uh, to bravely confront the dragon who's holding her captive. And he usually arrives in shining armor to battle it out with the dragon to the death. And if he succeeds in these stories, he gets the girl. He rescues the girl. She's amazed by his courage, so she wants to marry him. In short, it's a medieval rescue story. Now, remembering who we are in the story means when we look at that, we go, okay, well, who am I in that story? Am I the brave knight? who needs to go fight more battles. I need to face my dragons or face my giants and have more courage and pull out the sword of the spirit. Is, is that where we are in that story? Well, hopefully we're not the hideous dragon. I know I can be hangry sometimes, but hopefully that's not describing us. Who are we in that story? We're the girl. You see, the scripture uses language to describe God's people, the church, as the bride of Christ. And how does the Bible describe the devil? Well, Revelation 12, 9 depicts him as the great dragon. And so the knight, the one who came to slay the dragon and save the girl, that's Jesus Christ. The one who is preeminent over all creation, entered creation and was obedient to death. And to triumph over the dragon, the knight had to lay down his own life. But don't for a minute think that he's the knight in shining armor. No, he's the one who wears beaten, bloodied, and proven armor. The scripture says he was crushed for our iniquity and he died to set his bride free. Jesus slayed the dragon. He saved the girl. That's our story. Don't ever forget who you are and whose you are. You, as a believer, are qualified. You are delivered. You are redeemed. 
Thanks be to God for his grace. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful for the work that you've done at Calvary in your death, your burial, and on your glorious resurrection. We place our hope. Lord, we thank you that it is finished, that we don't have to attain to the works of the law. Because as Galatians 2.21 says, if that is the case, then Christ died for nothing. But Lord, no, we know that you died to redeem us, to redeem for yourself a people. We're so thankful, Lord, that you've qualified us, not because of our works, but because of your work. That you have delivered us, not in our own power, but because you hold all powers under your authority. We thank you that we are redeemed, again, not because we paid the price through religion, but because you paid the price with your precious blood. Lord, help us not to move on and graduate from these incredible truths, the truths of the gospel, but to grow in them, to see all stories as stories of true redemption. Lord, knowing that we are yours. We thank you for who we are in Christ and we pray that we would not forget who we are. Lord, lest we live in darkness and live in bondage. Lord, continue to set us free. Continue to remind us we're qualified. Lord, continue to encourage us so we can give thanks to you. We thank you for this study. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the rest of our day. In Christ's name and for Christ's glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, church. We wanted to tell you about a ministry that we're partnered with called Safe Families. Safe Families is a Christian organization that allows us to share Jesus' love with at-risk children and families within the foster care system. They do this by providing temporary housing for children through host families, coaching for parents, and support for host families. If you have ever considered being involved in foster care, but maybe don't have the time to meet the lengthy certifications, or are interested in becoming a parent coach, then please stop by the Safe Families table in the Welcome Center after service, or visit their website to get involved. Right now, we have a big need for volunteers in our Calvary Kids ministry. Our kids face new and unique challenges every day, but there are incredible opportunities to see our children grow in their faith every Sunday. We would love to expand our Calvary Kids team so that we can continue to reach the growing number of kids each week and would like to invite you to join our team. We're looking for individuals that can commit to serving two weeks out of the month to be a class teacher or helper. Visit the welcome table after service to learn more or sign up online at calvary.com. For more information about what's going on at Calvary, please visit calvary.com and sign up for our weekly Calvary Connection. God bless.